Well, hello, and thank you for joining me. As I was praying and meditating on what the Spirit would lead me to this week, I couldn't help but think about the condition of our world, and especially all that is going on in our country today, all the areas where we seem to be battling, uh, just to keep some semblance of peace and tolerance. It's almost as if we are at war or at least in a battle to maintain the values God has ordained for us to walk in. So let's begin our time with a prayer for our embattled nation. Father God, bless those leaders who lead by example, your example. Those who don't just talk about serving others, but truly do serve those who elected them. Thank you for leaders who don't just point to what needs to be changed, but roll up their sleeves and do something. Inspire them to stick with it. Creator, shorten the hallways between the leaders in Washington. May they be quicker to meet together, reason together, and work together towards solutions to the problems that vex our nation, seeking your wisdom to do so. Inspire kindness and cooperation. Nehemiah came to you on behalf of others, and so do we today. We pray for those in government who need to know you. May they see you at work in the world and turn to you. Make yourself known in ways that bring our leaders to you for inspiration. And Father, when Nehemiah confronted the rich nobles who were oppressing the poor, the nobles listened. Raise up people and leaders in our nation who tell the truth. Give us leaders willing to listen for your leading. Teach us to trust your plans for this nation, no matter what. Psalm 33, verses 10 and 11. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. The Apostle Paul was so dedicated to preaching the good news that he was willing to support himself so as not to be a financial burden to others. That's a leader on board with his mission. Prompt us and those who lead us to be equally dedicated in those areas of life where we lead. Paul didn't demand his rights. He set them aside if it helped him lead others to Jesus. Thank you for that model of leadership and servanthood. May it be reflected in the hearts and actions of those who lead in both our country and your church today. Amen. Today's scripture is found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 12. I will be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, Ephesians 6, verse 12. Let us hear the word of God. For our battle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is the word of God. Thanks and praise be to God. I've titled today's message, Stand Firm, because I really believe if we don't stand firm in our faith, we will surely not overcome the multitude of difficulties that seem to face us each and every day. So would you pray with me? Father, as we consider your word today, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your inspiration. We ask for your leading. We ask that you will anoint the words that I speak, that you will make them clear and whatever you would have us understand, that we would take that understanding deep into our hearts, that we might be better equipped to stand firm as we serve you and to share your truths with those we encounter day by day. For we pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, as I have said, I really believe we are in a battle. And because we both understand the battle and equip ourselves to overcome by standing firm, we also need to understand who 
it is that we are actually battling. We need to understand spiritual warfare. As we read today in Scripture, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear in his letter to the Ephesians who and what they were struggling against. And we need to understand something as well. The enemy has not changed. He just has better media and technology to confront us with. All that being said, we need, really need to be prepared. And what better way to look to God's Word? So let's see what the Help Finder Bible has to say about spiritual warfare. They begin with this. In order to be effective on the battlefield, a soldier must be both well-trained and properly equipped. The warrior must have access as well to both a defensive stronghold and offensive weaponry. He or she must know the enemy and be alert for surprise attacks. Must know the enemy and be alert. Brothers and sisters, friends, Make no mistake, we are under attack, and a whole lot of it is disguised as being beneficial or even essential to our well-being. We must do our homework, and like any good soldier, be well-equipped and be aware, be informed and alert. Be informed and alert. As we read, Paul wanted all his followers, and so he would want all followers of Christ Jesus, to not lose sight of who the real enemy is, no matter how cleverly he may disguise himself, because spiritual battle. And the Bible teaches that the best weapons for this warfare are the Word of God and prayer. The Bible tells us about many people who never stopped trusting God, even though they were mocked, persecuted, and even killed for their faith. Now, we here, especially in the United States, may never face martyrdom for being a Christian, but it is getting harder to be a follower of Christ. But truly, is our faith strong enough to endure even a little derision or scorn? Now, I know there are many who would want to challenge my statement about our current circumstances by asking if spiritual warfare is a reality. Is it true? Well, the scriptures begin early on telling us who we are battling and demonstrating how the battle is waged. Listen to what it says in Genesis 3, verse 1. You've all heard this before. The serpent was the shrewdest of all. The serpent was the shrewdest of all. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say? That's how shrewd the enemy is. Did God really say? We know what's written in Scripture. Eve knew what God had said. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1, gives an example of how even Jesus was challenged. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the deceiver. From the beginning of time and from the beginning of Jesus' own ministry, the Bible clearly teaches that human beings are involved in a spiritual battle, and it comes in many guises. Now, far from excluding us from spiritual battles, our faith, those of us who follow Christ Jesus, puts us right in the middle of these battles. And most importantly, if we fail to realize and plan for the battle, we can put ourselves in serious jeopardy. In Ephesians 6, verse 11, Paul had put on all of God's armor, 
so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Stand firm. Soldiers are trained to keep their equipment in battle ready condition. Weapons are cleaned and oiled. Communication equipment is checked and double checked. The helmets are kept in place in case of sudden attack. And if we prepare so diligently, if a soldier prepares so diligently for a human enemy, how much more ought we to prepare for battle against our spiritual enemy? So I would ask the question, are any of us fully prepared for this battle? See, spiritual warfare requires preparation through prayer, through unwavering faith and knowledge of biblical truth. Brave, bold Peter cautions, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8. James, Jesus' brother, both warns us and comforts a bit. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus tells us what we need to be prepared. Jesus answered Satan, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. On every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's the entirety of Scripture. We need to feed on it. We need to make it part of our daily routine. We must be alert at all times. Remembering when under attack, Jesus relied on the Word of God to resist his adversary. And when we resist the devil in the name and power of Christ Jesus, he will flee from us. In the Apostle John's first epistle, chapter 4, verse 4, we are assured, those of us who belong to Christ Jesus, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. See, at the name of Christ Jesus, Satan has no power. Jesus has overcome Satan, and so can we, because we have him within us. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, you know, that's all very churchy, theological stuff. But sincerely, how does, how can any of this spiritual warfare affect anyone? Well, 1 Peter 5, verse, verses 8 and 9 warn, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the deceiver. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, is to defy God, and to wear believers down until they are led into sin, and away from trusting God without any fear. So, are you feeling any pressure these days to trust sketchy leaders? Or maybe even some undocumented science? Or something that might be unbelievable? Just asking. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do we know the truth? The Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, and verse 44. John wants us to understand the danger that we are all in as he shares what Jesus had to say to those who refuse to see the truth and accept this lie. This is serious stuff. 
for you are the children of your father, the devil. Jesus is speaking to those who refuse to acknowledge the truth. And you love to do the evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Remember what it said in Genesis 3? Let's listen to the whole of that. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, we know that God did not say that. And she knew that God did not say that. But truly, the enemy's first tactic is to distort God's word. See, if he can raise suspicion about the integrity of Scripture, he can get us to question God's will and intentions for us. Can we recognize the lies? Because often they're going to come in the guise of cultural mores and worldviews. And they might just come from people we actually trust. Let's give this a little thought. How much attention, if any, have we truly paid to the removal of prayer from the public sector in the guise of religious intolerance? How about the removal of the Ten Commandments from our courts so that our judicial system no longer depends on the moral standards of God how much attention have we paid to that? How much have we stood up against that? In Chronicles 21, verse 1, it gives us a little history for us to look at. See, Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. It may sound like nothing on the surface, but a big part of spiritual warfare is getting us to rely on ourselves and not on God. Have you heard recently anyone say, well, you don't believe in science. We depend on science. Is that really true? God is the author of science. We're often tempted to rely on our own resources, the tangible, measurable assets that we believe that we can count on. Now, is it wise to understand our resources? Of course it is. But is it unwise to think that our ultimate security is in them? Of course it is. David's census was an egotistical inventory of his military might, and that was in direct contradiction to David's experience of God's provision in his life. He turned his back on the truths he knew, trusting in himself. As we can recall, these very tactics were tried on Jesus. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Again the devil took Jesus to a high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to Satan, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Matthew 4, verses 3 through 10. Did you notice something in there? 
every single time. Jesus said, it is written. He went to the Holy Scriptures. And even the devil said, it is written. The devil knows the Scripture. He knows how to use it against us. When this happens, we need to do the same. We need to use God's Word. In spiritual warfare, we need to understand how to fight back. Now, truly, at times it may seem odd to think of the Bible as a weapon. But in it, God reveals his plan of attack and defense against anyone or anything that tries to bring us, his children, followers of his son, down. We need to make it our battle plan. And if we don't read the scriptures, we won't know how to fight this battle that literally determines our destiny both here on earth and for eternity. Only by knowing who we are fighting, where the battle is, and how to defend ourselves will we be able to win. I've said this before and I will say it again and again and again. It is vital to read God's word as regularly as possible. We need to be reading his word every day because our best offensive weapon is God's word. Listen to these scriptures. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. David wrote that for us in Psalm 119, verse 11. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Paul wants us to pick this sword up. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Hebrews 4, verse 12. And in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, we get some really good advice from the Apostle Paul. It might seem a little symbolic, but it is great advice about God's Word. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of, of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We need to stand our ground because we have the power of Christ Jesus with us. We need to see beyond the human antagonists to the spiritual enemy. Look at how many things are being done in the world that we know violate God. We need to see who is behind them, even though those who advocate for them might be wonderful people. We need to see the true enemy, which is often working through the unaware parties involved. We need to prepare ourselves with the resources God provides. 
and then count on God's protection, not our own intellect or cleverness. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I've come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I'm here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. That was from Daniel 10, verses 12 through 14. This passage is a powerful image of the warfare and resistance in the unseen spiritual world. More importantly, it is showing us how our prayers enable God's power to triumph. Daniel prayed, and God answered his prayer. Through prayer and knowing scripture, we can tap into God's powerful defense rather than being limited by our own rational and finite thinking. We need to depend on God. However, in all this, don't we really want to ask this question? Can we expect this opposition to God to ever ease up? To ever stop? Will there be a revival? How long, O oh God? Don't we want to ask that question? Ezra 4, verses 4 and 5 read as such. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frightened the people and to frustrate their plans to build the temple all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This was a time when people wanted to do God's work, were trying for a revival. This is the story of the Jews returning to Jerusalem in 538 B.C., and what happened during the 17 years before Darius began to reign in 521 BC. Their enemies, the Jews' enemies, persisted in attempting to halt the rebuilding of the temple for almost two decades. The lesson for us? God's adversaries don't quit after one or two defeats. In this country, They've won a lot of battles. We need to stand firm. We must therefore strengthen ourselves and be prepared for a long campaign as we share the truth of a life lived as followers of Christ Jesus. We need to expect extended conflict and should lead us to careful preparation and patient determination, no matter how long and difficult the battle. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, we get some good advice. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And in Philippians 1, verse 27, and Philippians 4, verse 1, we hear from the Apostle Paul. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the truth of the faith of the gospel. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Paul wants us to be in the word and stand firm. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter three, verses one through five, he gives a warning that sadly seems to ring true for a lot today as well. Listen to this. But know this, 
difficult times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid these people. That's a serious warning for us today. That folks who act that way want us to believe that they are godly. But they deny God's power in their lives. As we finish up today, let's not end on that negative Let's hear what the Apostle John records Jesus saying in John 16, verse 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. God is sovereign. No matter what happens in this world, God is sovereign. And if we read the end of his book, we can be certain of what Jesus has done, will do. Christ Jesus said, I have conquered the world. He has. He is our salvation. For our faith to become strong and genuine, we will very likely need to encounter some testing. Sometimes the hardest test, I know it is for me, one of the most difficult ones, is to watch those we love dismiss us as they refuse to hear the truth of salvation. And it's during these hard times that our character is revealed and forced to grow. How we handle spiritual warfare, rejection and persecution shows who we really are on the inside and it reveals our level and reality of commitment to God. People are watching. Put on the armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm. Ephesians 6, 11. Dear ones, we live in a fallen, corrupt world. A world that is under the control of forces that do not have, and our only hope is to stand firm in our faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. That is our hope. Acts 16, 31. Amen. Would you receive a benediction from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians? May our Lord Jesus' eternal comfort and good hope by grace comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Amen and amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me again today. And if you need prayer or, or just someone to talk with or you'd like to discuss some of the things that I have said, Send me your contact information by messaging me on my Facebook page, and I promise you I will get back to you in a timely manner. May your week be filled to overflowing with the love of Christ, and may you dance before him until we meet again, whether it be here or in heaven above. God bless you. Just a little reminder, next week we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. All you'll need is some bread and a beverage. Again, God bless you.